Okay, so this is Lu. I'm the founding partner of the Fusion Fund and uh, AKA New Gene Capital. So we're all very honored to be the investor of Parajomics. Uh, stage is mess today, so I'm gonna start to throw out questions about the company and also the technology. So uh, I assume everyone knows uh, there are lots of high profile founders since early this year in the brain machine interface industry, including like Neuralink and also Kernel since last year. So I want you to share more about the differentiation between different companies, especially Parajomics. As a first mover in the industry, mm -hmm. how do you feel about the technology and the industry in general? I in general, I'm very happy that both uh, Brian Johnson and uh, Elon Musk have decided to be in this space now. It brings a lot of uh, profile to, you know, in 2015, when we founded the company, there were very few ambitious uh, investors like yourself that were willing to take a chance on us. No one had heard of brain machine interfacing, and people thought that it was science fiction. But I think now the field is gaining a lot of credibility. One of the differentiators between paradromics and some of the sort of new entrants is that uh, new entrance into the field of brain-computer interfaces has been very kind of top-down. There's a vision of where people want to go, and then they're trying to sort of fill out the details. So they have a lot of money, they can hire people. Uh, it's very promising, but it's, it's a very top-down approach. Whereas Paradromics uh, was founded by a group of scientists and engineers that, uh, ha in the pr pursuit of building a way to interface with the brain for basic research, uh, we found that the most exciting thing about being able to record and stimulate you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of neurons individually at scale wasn't necessarily that you could you know, work on basic, basic science things, but that you could use it as a backbone for a new generation of neural prosthetics. So we've coalesced around a core technology. We've been working on it for two years, and uh, maybe that's the differentiator. I see, yeah. So actually, the another thing is, uh, as I know, that you guys start to talk with uh, DAPA since 2016. And also, early this year, DAPA has an official news release talking about the program about brain machine interface and also their partnership with Paradromics. And they announced they are going to deploy 18 million US dollars in funding, non diluted funding, to the company to help and also partnership with the company for next generation of technology development. Would you mind sharing more information about yeah. that? Not so, sure whether you're under NDA or anything. No, so no, no, we, we can talk about it. Details up to you. I mean, we've actually been very fortunate because around the time that we founded Paradromics, uh, the, brain, the Obama Brain Initiative was coming into full force. And uh, shortly after we decided we're going to build a first demonstration device uh, research system to sell to labs, the NIH came out with a program supporting uh, large-scale recording uh, systems, and we got an SBIR from the NIH in, in sort of rapid order. We're now looking at releasing a product in early next year that'll be the fulfillment of that. And then just after we, we got that money, we started gearing up to apply to this new DARPA program. It's called Neural Engineering System Design. And uh, the aim is to build a brain implant that can handle high volumes of data. And it was great, because that's exactly what we were building. And so we, uh, we were encouraged to apply. We applied, and now we're one of the six performers on that program. The five other performers are a uh, consortia of sort of top universities, the normal players. And then the sixth is this uh, small operation in San Jose, Prodromics. Great, great. So what I believe with this step of funding will be uh, lots of opportunity and also door opens for Paradigm, especially for the uh, clinical trial of the new devices and also the technology development. So what is the next step for the technology and the product in terms of the company aiming for? Uh, absolutely. So right now we have a system that's uh, about as big as this microphone here, and uh, it can handle up to uh, 65,000 channels. And we're looking to reduce this into a tiny one centimeter by one centimeter chip that can be placed in the brain. And uh, we have a very clear roadmap for doing that, and that's exactly what DARPA is supporting with the uh, $18 million. And we'll have this in three years. Great. So actually, I believe lots of people still think as brain machine interface, some technology belongs to the future. But as you mentioned, in three years, you're going to have this chip ready 
actually small enough to be implanted into the human brain. So how do you see the commercialization and also different type of application into different industry for this technology? Yeah. Well, one thing following up on the sort of science fiction thing, I, I predict that in three years when people see what we've built, they're going to wonder why we didn't have it 10 years ago. Because it's not like uh, quantum computing or certain areas of synthetic biology where you kind of have to lay the track ahead of you and you're still waiting to invent like the next section. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we're just assembling some technologies that have come to fruition over the last decade. And it, yeah, so I think everyone will be uh, happily surprised. Uh, looking forward at the applications, the first people to receive brain-machine interfaces will be those who will benefit it, benefit from it the most. Uh, people for whom the surgical risk is obviously offset by the increase in quality of life. So the most serious group of people would be uh, locked in patients, patients that can't move and can't speak, um, that are fully conscious and maybe communicating with the world through like eye blinks. Mm -hmm. um, but the ability to sort of move around, speak, that's going to be life changing. Yeah. And then Moving out from there, you would look at people with uh, tetraplegia, people with sort of uh, mid to late onset uh, ALS. Uh, Stephen Hawking is a famous example of someone with ALS. And then my prediction is that as you know, more and more thousands of people have brain implants, it's shown to be safe, uh, doctors feel comfortable with the surgery, you'll have people who uh, perhaps suffer an amputation that start thinking about getting a brain implant to restore uh, function with a robotic arm, and it'll just grow out from there. Great. So you mentioned about the first uh, type of the application to more like uh, disease patients or maybe potential uh, disability people. And I'm wondering, uh, so for for general population, mm -hmm. what is the next step? Is it possible to apply this technology to make us become a human, like a superhuman in the future? I think that you'll see this. This is in my opinion, quite far down the road. Uh -huh. But I think that this transformation would look a little bit like how cosmetic surgery has been um, in our lifetime, mm -hmm. where initially there are, you know, there are procedures that are done in a medical setting, and as they become more and more routine, uh, you can start thinking about using them for non-serious conditions. But, I, yeah, I see a whole continuum between, you know, the most serious medical cases in the next few years to you know, potentially uh, healthy humans coming in for a brain implant uh, down the road. Great. I, I'm, I guess lots of people would be uh, wondering, like, how does the whole clinical trial go with this technology? And uh, uh, what DAPA would help you guys and support you to accelerate in the whole process for really apply this technology into human being? Yeah, so everyone has to go through the FDA, even, yeah, yeah. even <laughs> DARPA. <laughs> but luckily there's, I think, uh, widespread buy-in that uh, Brain-machine interfaces are going to be the future. I mean, the FDA had a sort of liaison there at some of the DARPA meetings, and everyone wants this to happen. Uh, just we all also want it to happen safely. Okay. So actually, I think we only have one uh, around one minute left. I will ask one question and then open to the public for other like for more questions about technology. So would you mind share more about the current stage of the uh, product? And uh, I know you're working on the new generation of the product. And uh, what the current stage and what's your goal for next step? Yeah, so where we are right now is we're building a system that will be used by researchers around the world to collect neural data at scale. So it'll support recording on 65,000 microwires that can be inserted into the brains of uh, animals, large and small, can record from you know as many as 100,000 neurons simultaneously. And that will really change how uh, certain types of experiments and certain types of uh, sort of understanding of the brain happens. And uh, that'll be, you know, that product will be selling next year. And that'll really bolster sort of the efforts to build out the medical implant. Mm -hmm that we're, deve we're already developing that. I mean, we're already designing the chip that's going to go into the sort of human brain. Um, and we'll have the whole thing sort of fully packaged and uh, ready for preclinical trials in 2020. Yeah, so, so the current one, the commercialization one, is for the animals and also the chip. Absolutely, yeah. OK, great. So uh, any question from the public, from the audience? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, there's not a device code for high bandwidth brain machine interface yet, so there'll be some uh, some development that has to happen there. 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think after this uh, match, we'll stay around for a more uh, couple. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to talk with him if you want to know if you would like to know more details about the technology and the exciting program they have with DAPA. Thank you. Thank you.